Hi, everybody. Are you going to be yelling in there? Any Hi, soon? can you hear me? Is that the mic there? We're going to get started. I hear you. Yeah, this is Dr. Aida Wen. I'm a geriatrician with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at Japsom, and we are really glad that you joined us on the Geriatrics Echo. Uh, if you never joined us before, we run on the second Wednesday of every month from 12 to 1 as a one-hour session after a short lecture. We will share expertise from the rest of the team and then open up for case discussions. And we invite you to share any ger geriatric cases, even if it's a topic uh, not related to today's uh, topic, lecture topic. Uh, and our interdisciplinary team is willing to uh, share our collective wisdom uh, with you. Turns out we actually have a great case that was submitted, so we're going to talk about, we're going to definitely leave time afterwards uh, for that discussion. Uh, for those who present a full case, have an opportunity to receive a $150 gift card courtesy of Echo So uh, this is a CME activity uh, sponsored by the HCCME, a joint venture between the Hawaii Medical Association and the John A. Burns School of Medicine. This program is also approved for the National Association of Social Workers, wide chapter for up to one social work CE contact hour. And as a reminder, you must complete the evaluation in order to receive CME, CE, or certificates of attendance. And evaluations can be found on the website under the evaluations tab or following the link in the chat box. So we also ask that you enter your full name and credentials of everyone in attendance in the chat box at this time so that we can keep attendance. So, um, as, uh, as you know, all sponsors of CME are required to execute a conflict of interest policy and speakers are expected to disclose uh, any apparent conflicts of interest that have a direct bearing on the subject matter today and at this time. Uh, I disclose that I have no relationships with commercial supporters for the presentation I'm going to give today. Okay, so today's topic is a dysphagia in older adults. And, um, I have with me today our um, ECHO interdisciplinary plant panel. We have Mary Gada, our public health nurse, and we have Chad Kawakami, he's our pharmacy, PharmD, and Noreen Wong. Wong is our social worker, but she usually joins us and she's not able to make it today. Okay, a couple logistics. We want to stay HIPAA compliant, so do not share protected health information, and we can discuss cases without identifying information. There is a mute button at the bottom left-hand corner. Make sure it's on mute, otherwise we will hear paper rustling, uh, chewing, extraneous noise, etc. So unmute yourself if you want to speak up. Uh, and there's a chat button that uh, please uh, feel free to bring up the chat box and type your name, location, and any questions you have as we're going along and we can get to it when we have a time for uh, Q&A. Okay, so I think we're ready. So, on if I can. Okay, we're going to have to Okay, let's see who we have on the. Uh, on the attendance today, since we're waiting here. Oh, oh, you got it up, okay. Okay, so this is today's topic, dysphagia in the older adult. Um, I put these slides together with uh, Sherry Gu Yoshino, with, from, uh, she's a speech therapist uh, instructor at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And um, we actually gave this talk uh, a month or two ago uh, at another venue, so, that, so that's why we have uh, some of her slides here, but um, I just wanted to give that acknowledgement. Okay, we have no relevant financial disclosures. We're going to talk a little bit about dysphagia, the common symptoms and the causes, the indications for swallow evaluations and the management and treatment options. And then we're going to spend some time talking about how do we have that discussion with patients and families about tube feeding and sort of uh, providing the person-centered care to optimize uh, the quality of life. Okay, so what is dysphagia? Uh, dysphagia, by definition, is difficulty in swallowing. It's very prevalent, uh, in, especially in nursing homes. 
and especially in folks with dementia, stroke, or Parkinson's disease, basically neurological problems. These are the general signs and symptoms like coughing, choking, hoarse voice, feeling that something is stuck in the back of the throat, that's the globus sensation. A lot of work, effort to swallow, selective eating, and basically it compromises quality of life, right? If you can't eat, you know, you can't enjoy life as much. If, if for you, you know, food is life. Um, of course, involuntary weight loss, difficulty gaining weight, malnutrition, dehydration, aspiration, pneumonia, and uh, other, other problems. So this is just an overview of normal swallowing. There are a couple of uh, swallowing phases. The first phase is the oral phase where the liquid and food enter the mouth and are manipulated and chewed, mixed and swallowed. And so that's basically if, if having, uh, figuring out how to process the food and get it past the back of your throat. The second phase is the pharyngeal phase where it actually gets to the back of the throat and enters and passes through the pharynx. And this is the high risk here. You can see that little red arrow at the bottom. This is kind of where that's the back of the pharynx where people may have trouble uh, handling that and then food may go down the wrong pipe. And then the esophageal phase is when the food gets past the pharynx and it goes down the esophagus. That's the pipe that goes into the stomach. And if there's problems with motility or you know constriction, then you may have trouble uh, uh, with that as well. So that's the overview, the three main phases. This is just a little discussion about the oral and pharyngeal dysphagia. Basically, if you have trouble with this phase, you're keeping food in your mouth. You're chewing, prolonged chewing. You're pocketing food in the, in the pocket of your cheek and you're not letting it out there. Or you're spilling fluid, so you're drooling and the food is coming out from one side or the other. Uh, dysarthria, you may also have trouble speaking because you have trouble with your, the muscles of your tongue and your lips and you have trouble with that. Or um, you may see things like coughing during or shortly after eating and drinking, though not necessarily. Um, and then complaints that food is sticking uh, in the throat, or if there's no complaints, you may have a wet voice uh, after the swallow, and you may hear people, they sound kind of gurgly when they talk. And so that's a sign of, uh, of, of uh, possible uh, uh, pharyngeal dysphagia. So what kinds of things cause this are basically neurological problems. So if you've had a stroke, dementia, and Parkinson's, those are the, the most common conditions that, that cause this. Um, having trouble manipulating and handling food in the mouth may also be caused by dry mouth. If you have lots of multitude of anticholinergic drugs, uh, it'll be hard to manipulate the food. Um, if you try to eat something really, really dry, <laughs> you have trouble. Also sedating drugs, so uh, you know people on long-acting opioids or sleeping pills, psychotropic drugs, if they're kind of a little bit hungover or they're kind of post to off, um, they are high risk for, for having trouble handling the food and getting it down uh, correctly. Um, and other problems, maybe anorexia, if yeah. are on anorexia, uh, people not want to eat, uh, then that, that, that causes very similar problems. Weakness and con deconditioning, I actually see quite a lot. Um, so they may not have necessarily a, a neurological event per se, but if they're just very weak and because they've been in the ICU for one month or two months and they haven't gotten out of bed, uh, they are weak and deconditioned, they may not have a neurological problem, but they're super weak. And then they have dysphagia. Um, and when they get stronger, their swelling gets stronger. And of course, if you have head and neck cancer, that there's tumors, you know, in your mouth or in the t under the tongue or in the back of your throat, then of course that 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 impinges uh, uh, on swallowing. Um, when you have oral pharyngeal dysphagia, the you know the, the the we should be referring to the speech language pathologist because they will help us uh, with that assessment and also on um, treatments. So the speech language pathologist is actually, they do this, what we call a clinical swallow evaluation. And they, 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 they talk to the patient, they examine their oral structure, they, they do an assessment of swallowing, they use different textures and different liquid thick, uh, uh, consistencies, and they do certain trials and they have compensatory and rehab techniques. So asking them to say like, tuck their chin in or swallow, double swallow or alternate uh, you know, foods with liquids. So there's lots of different um, strategies that, that they can use as they do the clinical swallow evaluation and sort of minimize risk uh, for, for aspiration. Um, 
And then, so, so the diagnosis, um, so yeah, I was basically just uh, summarizing this. So they, they figure out what is the optimum food and liquid textures, the strategies, counseling, education, training, um, and basically based on the patient and their family, we put together a personalized treatment plan. Um, and of course, if they see a need and the problem is a little bit uh, more than that, they will say, you know, maybe we should get them to see gastroenterologists. Maybe they need a modified barium swallow uh, or, or even further than that, some endoscopy. So um, it, it does not um, uh, determine, I mean, because they're just offering food, they're not actually doing a study. Um, they can't really determine whether or not there is an aspiration going on for sure, because of that, you basically need to get a swallow evaluation. Um, okay, so just moving on uh, quickly, this is the esophageal dysphagia problem. When you have trouble in your esophagus, you can see that bolus of food trying to go down the pipe, right? So um, if there's a problem in your esophagus, uh, it might hurt to swallow, and that's called odynophagia. Uh, unable to swallow, if there's a blockage and things can't get through and it feels stuck, uh, you may also, it may sound like they have a hoarse voice. Regurg is when food backs up. Um, you may have feelings of frequent heartburn or acid, um, or needing to cut food into smaller pieces because they actually can't get past a very narrow uh, stricture. Um, and so they may notice that they can't eat or they can't eat certain foods and textures. And then they may have frequent respiratory problems. Uh, like looks like asthma, but actually it's the reflux uh, causing the, the the, uh, the bronchospasm or infection. Um, what are the causes of that? Common causes of esophageal dysphagia are achalasia, which is basically esophageal motility disorder. So the esophagus, you know, is this uh, muscular, you know, smooth muscle pipe, and, the, and it squeezes the food down the tube like a snake, you know, gets gets the bolus uh, down down its uh, body. So um, if if there's a problem with the motility, it doesn't move very well, or if there's spasms which can happen, um, so certain times, sometimes stress, trigger food, something like that can cause sudden spasm in the esophagus and things kind of feel stuck. There might, of course, be mechanical problems, cancer. People may survive breast cancer just fine, but if they got radiation treatment to the area, they may cause this uh, 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 stricture in the esophagus, and you know, then that's kind of the problem they, they live with after that. Um, there's also a problem with Barrett's esophagus because if you have lots of GERD, um, that is the reflux, the acid going up and damaging the tissues with all the inflammation. It can cause permanent damage to the um, esophageal, the, uh, the, the tissues in the esophagus right near the stomach. And so that, that can cause esophageal um, uh, uh, stricture as well. And then there's weakness and deconditioning, um, like I described the last time. Just, yeah, when your whole body's weak, every muscle is weak. Um, and yeah, so if you're concerned that the symptoms sound more like esophageal dysphagia, then make a referral straight to the gastroenterologist. And they can actually, you know, visualize the problem uh, in there. So yeah, so these are the in indications for the instrumental swallow valve that's with the gastroenterologist uh, to go through, if, especially if you're unclear whether, you know, uh, with, you know, is it pulmonary or is it, you know, airway or is it GI and you want to make sure and you want to actually take a look. Um, and, and especially if you see, are concerned about things like um, cancer, um, Barrett's esophagus. esophagus. Um, and then if you have a history of medical conditions at high risk for that. Um, all right. Okay. This is the video. So part of uh, a modified variant swell can can sometimes it's just swallowing variant, but sometimes it's a video component as well. And so this is you can get direct visualization of the the mouth, the pharynx, the upper esophageal, and, the, and you can actually look at how things are functioning as well if they're going into spasm or if things are refluxing. So you can actually see that and you can um, observe. Um, so that is the fiber optic and dust. Could be uh, evaluation of the swallow. Um, you can observe the flow of the food. Okay. So what is um, so what is the benefit of that is that um, you can actually see aspiration, and then you can consider you know if changes in food and texture might be helpful, and strategies to facilitate the safe and efficient swallowing. So 
um, basically a lot of times these things are ha they occur with the um, you need with the speech therapist with the uh, dietitian a gastroenterologist and you have to get together and uh, get a plan a personalized plan so um, so how do we manage and treat this so there are exercises um, that um, the, the speech language pathologist uh, can train uh, people in doing such as uh, oral motor swallowing exercise because uh, they they have to practice how to chew or strengthen the muscles in the back of the throat and the double swallowing and things like that uh, strength training um, there's these other techniques which I don't really know about that the therapist can can do um, of course they um, they figure out appropriate texture preferred foods and drinks uh, get the right temperature sometimes having cold or fizzy drinks can help stimulate uh, to be more aware of what you're swallowing and so that might be more effective or smaller more frequent meals accessible snacks so basically gives uh, patients and families a real strategy what to do to optimize the feeding uh, also um, you know they talk about head and body positioning you know how do we position the body sitting up straight upright you know leaning forward or head down and the rate of feeding you know, how big should the bolus be it should be a half a teaspoon one teaspoon you know, what is a good size for that um, of course, making sure they're optimally alert and feeding only when they're alert, not when they're half drowsy, um, right? Um, of course, other uh, environments, right? So if uh, folks with dementia, for example, are very distracted by, by things going on around them, they're not focusing on eating or if they're anxious or things like that, then, um, yeah, you need to modify the environment to optimize eating. Sometimes having company is good. We all do better when we eat with company. Um, <coughs> optimized communication. Um, consistent prompting some people forget to eat and so they need um, someone to remind them to hey take a bite oh here have, have a spoon you know things like that so and uh, maintain the uh, routines um, the other thing I, I, I do actually in terms of counseling I, I counsel the families um, Thing. I know that you know it's convenient here. Yeah, we want to be done with dinner in 10, 20 minutes, but you know, just why don't you just plan that dinner is going to be like two hours long, you know, and and just enjoy it because it's it's if you stress so much on getting the food in and getting it done quickly, um, everybody's just going to be stressed and unhappy, and nobody's going to want to eat very much. So you know, really, just just plan on that as a quality of life thing. You know, they accept the expectation that it's going to be. A long, uh, you know, session. We're going to sit here and we're going to eat slowly and we're going to have good conversation, enjoy each other, and and do that. So that that's important too. Otherwise, people get stressed out over this whole thing. Okay. Um, so I wanted to get to the topic of feeding tubes because this is this is a this is a challenging thing. I'm going to move this. Uh, Yeah, so why, um, so what's good about feeding tubes? So it's not uncommon, right? We, we have people, they have some hospitalized for something, then they get a swallow eval, and then, you know, somebody recommends, oh, let's just go for tube feeding. You know, what's the flip side? What's, what's the risk for that? I and mean, what are the benefits? Obviously, the benefit is, is you can get food down. Uh, much easier, right? It takes less time. It's easier. You just plug it in and let it drip, and then you're done. So that doesn't do anything. Uh, you don't have to do very much. Um, but the the problem is is that you get um, decreased quality of life. So uh, people who are too fed tend to be more isolated, have decreased human contact. They uh, because the tube is a foreign object. They um, maybe picking at it and trying to pull it out and unfortunately that is a very common problem and they get restrained in order to get that um, to prevent the, the tube from being pulled out and they don't actually have the gratification of tasting food. Isolation decreased human contact is just purely the fact that you know you could just hang the bag and walk away you don't actually have to sit there and coax them for two hours to eat but it's that human contact that actually is uh, what they need. Um, other things that uh, tube feeding, of course, if it's, you know, different uh, formulations and whatnot can cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. 
uh, if it's being run too fast, there's too much of it, uh, too much volume that the, 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 the stomach can't empty fast enough, or they may have too much um, fat in it or you know, whatever, fiber, not enough fiber. And then you can have all these GI problems that you sort of um, add to that. Other complications, I don't need to tell you how many complications I've seen with those feeding tubes, you know, with bleeding, infection, skin irritation, the acid that just leaks constantly around there and you have to always be protecting the skin, blocked out and it could be falling out and pulled out um, inadvertently or on purpose. Um, and then constantly trying to like oh, figure out how to get it back in there again. Uh, people, uh, because you have this tube in front of you, you can't, it's, and you're being fed, turning is a little bit more difficult. And so that increased risk for pressure ulcers. And then because you're kind of uh, feeding to food right into the stomach, and if it's too much in the butt, the stomach's not empty as well, the reflux actually is more frequent as well, and you're likely to get aspiration in the morning, especially if you lie down before all the food is gone from the stomach. And then also more likely to get fluid overload, because you really can't regulate how fast, how much this can go in. So those are a lot of the risks that go in. So that's that's kind of what you're weighing against, the benefits and the risks. Um, so do I ever have people go into feeds? I do. Um, but, you know, these have to be considered carefully. So basically we should think about it as it benefits those who are not in the last stages of life. So, you know, so if you have an acute stroke and, you know, you have you got your, you know, uh, TPA or something like that, you open it up and they, they expect a very quick recovery um, or even some recovery over six months or so, um, it gives it buys them time for healing and, and it's kind of recovering some of the damage in the brain, you know, uh, head trauma or somebody who's critically ill been in the ICU for a long time, but you know, they didn't have a neurological event, they just had basically they were septic or something uh, like that, and and they became very, very deconditioned. And then, just you know, um, just giving them a little time, a little more rehab, a little tube feeding, and then after some time, being able to wean that off and then get back on total normal feeds. Uh, as well. Uh, so things like that that are kind of reversible, you want to wait and see and give them a chance and things like that. But that's when I would say it's beneficial. Um, especially if they're, you know, more young, more functional patients, uh, things like that. Head and neck cancer, of course, because, well, you know, you can't get past, past the blockage. And they stay, still may live quite some time. And same with ALS, right? I mean, we don't really know how ALS progression can be a little bit unpredictable, so we don't, while it is progressive, can be unpredictable, and uh, we, you know, probably feeding them for a while while they still have some cognition and quality of life uh, is reasonable uh, for quality of life purposes. So the so the, the main issue is when does it, what does it not benefit? So tube feeding does not help in end stage disease. So what I mean by end-stage disease is things like Alzheimer's, end-stage Alzheimer's disease, uh, end-stage Parkinson's disease, terminal cancer, uh, you know, persistent vegetative state, those kinds of things. So if you have a you know, very poor prognosis. Um, uh, people have done studies and looked at you know, whether tube feed um, prolongs life, doesn't really do that. They, they would actually die from you know, pneumonia or sepsis, neurosepsis, or something else uh, because they have an end stage disease. It doesn't actually prevent aspiration. Um, you would think that it does, but because of the reflux, reflux problems from the stomach, and also they're actually still swallowing their own saliva, so they're actually still swallowing things that uh, you can't completely prevent aspiration. It does not help heal pressure ulcers. Um, and it does not help improve functional status. So if those are the things that you're looking for, it's, that's not what we're going to should be expecting. So, so yeah, so that's the tricky things. How do we help patients and families make the decision? We have to consider, of course, the medical facts uh, and look at their prognosis, but also some personal subjective uh, elements as well. The, 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 the good thing is that usually, um, and it should be, it should not be made in an, under an emergency 
situation. It really should be very um, well thought through, um, carefully um, discussed, um, weighing risks and benefits, and, and you know maybe even a time limited trial. Uh, not not moving to this very very quickly. Um, so this is the uh, right. This is the common problem that uh, families. Uh, may present, right? They, they have a question like, well, I can't, well, what are you talking about? You don't want to, you don't think we should tube feed them. You know, we can't just let her starve. That's, that's criminal, you know? Um, and of course, if, if that's the way the family looks at it, that is a very valid problem. And if that's, you, and it's, and, and if you tell them that it's not going to be helpful and they, if they, this is the way they see it, that's, they're not going to believe you. And they're going to insist that they get to feed. So I think what's really important is that we really need to, it's the way we frame it and the way we discuss it that is going to be the most helpful. We're trying to help them understand um, what is beneficial and what are we weighing it against. So we have to validate the intent because everybody is well-meaning. Everybody wants the best for the patient. And uh, we need to think about, you know, how do we interpret this in their storyline? So just wanted to give you a few framing, reframing examples. Uh, this, I'm just going to give some credit to Dr. Christina Bell, who has really, she did a lot of this work when she was at the department a number of years ago, um, and she really thought about this whole tube feeding issue. So if, um, you know, the patient in yellow says, he's dying because he's not able to eat or drink, you know, empathetically, right, validate the concern. I understand how worrisome that might be, right? Of course, it must be it must seem that getting food and water into him would be important, right? And so we've noticed that, you know, he only wants small amounts of food and water, right? So yes, he's not able to eat and drink, and it, it, we really would want to try that, but he only wants small amounts of food and water, and we really don't want to force feed him, you know? Um, so people with this illness who are dying, say with cancer or something, tend not to be thirsty or hungry. You know, they're not, they have anorexia from the tumor uh, necrosis factors and things like that swirling around in their body. They're not hungry. It's part of the natural process that they're not hungry and it's okay, you know. Um, but they say, we can't let them starve to death, which can be prevented by artificial feeding. He goes, you're right. If he were starving or thirsty, we could prolong his life. That would make sense, right? But if we feed him with two feeding, you know, and it doesn't necessarily prolong their life, they're going to die anyway, you know, it seems like starvation, but this is not exactly what's going on. He is dying from a terminal condition, you know, so share another possible alternative interpretation, and then share more information, right, so it would be great if two feeding worked that way, however, in other patients with this illness, we have found that two feeding does not make people live longer or feel better. Right. And then, of course, you can talk about the other risks uh, that you see. Um, so we're just going to do nothing. <laughs> going to get that, too. And so I always say, you never take things away from people without giving them something back. So we say, no, 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 not at all. We're, we're not doing nothing. We're going to pay special attention to his quality of life. We're going to spend more time with him. In fact, you know, get more family members in and, you know, uh, if it's uh, we can you know maybe provide small oral feedings for quality of life. You may not get enough in to sustain him, but at least he'll be happy tasting the foods and eating with the family. You know, and that that's that's important. So we need to focus on his quality of life. So we frame that. You know, how are we going to uh, love on him more? You know, he may not be able to eat drink much, but if there's some really special food that he really likes. So facilitating the nurturing and looking at pleasure versus calories, you know? So sometimes I say, yeah, like, don't you want to try some ice cream, you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know? And if you're too feet, you don't get that, that joy of tasting the ice cream, right? Um, and then talk about how the family can help. So you might say, okay, at this stage, the mouth is, dry mouth is a big problem. You can help us by, swabbing his mouth or, you know, uh, putting some uh, chapstick or things like that, um, you know, ice chips or whatever it is. So 
uh, really giving them things to do instead of feeding. So how, how can I love them if I don't feed, right? So give them other things, other ideas, things to do. Yeah, why don't you come and bring some music, you know, bring some reading, uh, you know, bring your guitar, whatever it is. Yeah, bring your ukulele. Okay, so so what's important? So so we need to think about other alternatives and suggestions, not just tube feeding. So we can talk about okay. Let's try to maximize their appetite if we can. You know, let's manage constipation. Let's find some medications that might be causing anorexia or depression or constipation or sedation. And then we see if we can stop things that make the condition eating worse, right? Um, so some meds are like sleeping pills, bladder control medications, uh, alendronate, and so those kinds of things can make eating problems worse. Dental care, when your teeth hurt and your mouth is not, yeah, that then, yeah, you, you don't have your dentures in or whatever, then of course that's not optimal. Careful hand feeding is always important. And use favorite foods for quality of life feeding. I, I actually love dreaming with the family and the patient about their favorite foods. It makes them really think, start thinking about these things uh, and thinking about quality of life instead of thinking about getting the calories in. And then even with, um, with dental care, <clears throat> excuse me, I've, I've seen that um, sometimes patients have, have dentures, but we forget that uh, over time they, they lose weight and then the dentures don't fit any, right. any, anymore and it can be painful. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to kind of look at is like, do the dentures, are, are they appropriate fit? Yeah. 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 Of course, there's hospice referral as well because they also provide more support and other ways to show love like massage, reading, music, those kinds of things. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, choosing wisely um, for AGS, for ABIM, for hospice and palliative management, for several societies and, and also AMDA, there's, it's under choosing wisely. Feeding tubes for people with Alzheimer's dementia is, is something that is not recommended. Uh, instead, offer oral assisted feeding. So careful hand feeding is what is um, recommended for that. I want to mention, so so I talked about reframing and how to do that. And also education is really, really important. How you frame it and educate is really important. So um, this is a study that Susan Mitchell uh, did. Uh, and she worked with uh, Dr. Valandez, who I guess has put together all these ACP videos for decision support. So basically, this is an education video to improve nursing home care and end stage dementia. And so it's a 12 minute video, and so patients and families can watch it and, make, and help them make more informed decisions. And so I guess they did this as an intervention and found that residents who got this ACP video intervention were more likely to have directives for no tube feeding at six months compared to those who didn't get this. Uh, video. Um, they had more documented goals of care discussion um, at three months. So actually look at that 16% versus 7.9, right? So that's quite a lot more goals of care discussions are happening. And then um, when comfort care was preferred, more likely to have both do not hospitalize and no two feeding directives. So this is just part of like the way you frame it, that it's providing more education in families understand it more, they're more likely to, to choose comfort. Uh, as a goal. Uh, I also wanted to just point out another resource. Um, we actually uh, put together this uh, caregiver video um, for that describes a lot of what we talked about today and it gives uh, tips on how to prepare foods and puree it and, and where to find stuff in order to um, and, and makes it less daunting I, I think um, to, to be able to provide um, careful hand feeding. Um, this is available in English, Chukis, Ilocano, and Samoan as well. And then finally, I wanted to sort of end with this idea of reintroducing oral feeding because, you know, sometimes patients come out of the hospital and they wind up uh, in the nursing facility, they wind up at home, outpatient, and they're on the tube feeding already. And so the question is, are they doomed to be tube fed forever? Or is there ever an option to discuss taking them off tube feeds and trying to go back to oral feeding? So Dr. Christina Bell did this uh, study um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and basically looked at uh, the characteristics of the uh, patients who were tube fed and non tube fed, and it turns out that most of them had 
prior stroke and lack of DNR status as the, their common uh, things. And, um, and, and it turned out that uh, most of the cognitively intact group were like 60% would never be assessed for tolerance of oral diet later on. And, they, and that 76.5% uh, did not have goals of care reassessed uh, after, after the hospital stay. So, you know, that just goes to the point that, you know, why don't we need to talk a little bit more? And so they developed an interdisciplinary um, tube feeding reassessment protocol. And so what they did is that they kind of looked at more cognitively intact uh, residents uh, and had and said ask those cognitively intact residents for swallow reassessment, and and based on that, about fifty percent of them were able to resume oral feeding. So half of them, of course, could not, but half of them, uh, and and they continued exclusive tube feeding. But half of them got some quality of life back, which is quite a lot. And of those with end stage disease, so those were the cognitively intact. So on, for those with the end stage disease, a hundred percent had their goals of care reassessed and. 80, almost 82% of the families, they elected individualized oral feeding with or without tube feeding. So, um, so even if they need tube feeding to maintain their caloric intake, um, I would say that offering them food by mouth does, uh, does improve quality of life. And so even if the expectation is not to you know, meet all the caloric needs, but, but just improve their quality of life, it's, worth, it's a worth a try. And uh, I've done that uh, a number of times with my patients. And, you know, even if it's nothing but they have ice cream, you know, every once in a while, it's just the pleasure, the joy, the pure pleasure of it. And so, anyway, so successful reintroduction of oral feedings for two fed patients um, wouldn't happen unless you actually advocate for it and you go and reassess it um, and, and push for a quality of life. And that's it for my talk. So I'm just going to open it up to a couple of questions. Then I want to move on to the case that was um, sent, sub submitted um, by Dr. Dan Saltman. Uh, let's go. Can you open up to the chat room and see if we have any questions from this? Aida? Yes. I, I had a couple of comments uh, about that. Thank you very much. That was a good, that was an excellent talk. Very interesting. Who's talking um, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to, um, let's see, I wanted to just make two comments. Uh, one is that um, I, I thought it was, uh, it, the barium swallow is a kind of thing you don't need a gastroenterologist for. This is sort of for earlier stage people when you're doing the, the evaluation. And it's pretty easy. Yeah. I once yeah. had a gastroenterologist tell me that with a nickel's worth of barium, you could answer the question. And so that's the kind of thing you can order just through radiology, and it's really sort of quick and easy. And and provided they've gone through a, a, a risk assessment about aspiration, that can that's a, as, as a next step that can answer a lot of questions without, without invoking referrals and special other specialists. And then the, the other, the other comment I had was that, uh, that, it, that body position is really important. If you're, if your chin is to the chest, it's, it's hard to, it's harder to aspirate. So people might remember that by, by the, when you're trying to intubate somebody or you're trying to open their airways, you put their head back and you jut the chin forward and that opens the airway. Yes. But the opposite of that is, is that you put your chin to chest and that right. sort of closes right. the airway and opens up the posterior esophagus tract and that's the better way to swallow things that with less risk of aspiration. Yes, yes, yeah. so those are some of the strategies they say, yeah, chin tuck. Chin tuck with all. And then I just wanted to just clarify a little bit. Yes, the barium swallow is just a regular barium swallow, but a modified barium swallow is when the speech therapist goes and sits with them and works with the different consistencies and stuff. So it's a little different, the modified barium. But. Ah, yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, they use different textures on it. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So they have uh, barium in the you know cookie and barium in the applesauce or whatever it is. Yeah. 
Okay, so with some of these questions here, what is the ethics behind not offering tube feeding if the family doesn't bring it up? What are the ethics behind not offering tube feedings if the family doesn't bring it up? Yes. Um, you know, I think that basically, you know, we're, we're medical professionals and we should recommend things that are, um, that we believe will be beneficial. You know, I don't think we should be recommending things that are not beneficial, you know, or detrimental. So um, it, it might be, um, so I don't think you're obligated to bring it up. However, because many people talk about it and you know, they, they, they're going to have cousins and strangers and everybody's going to bring it up and start to question them. So, so you know, you may hear about this, um, but, and this is my take on this and just explain. So at least they'll be able to um, kind of frame it in their mind. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Can you so read the that? Next one is, <laughs> yeah. If advanced directives say no feeding, no two feeding, is it okay to do two feeding if medical facts show that it may be beneficial to do trial short term two feeding? If the advanced uh, directive, well, okay, so now we're going <laughs> to move into the realm of consent, informed consent, and uh, Dan Saltman State's presentation a little bit. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, uh, basically, the, the idea with advanced directives is that they, they, they state what they want in the event that they cannot um, express, but they also designate somebody who uh, helps them make decisions. But suppose, supposedly, that person is supposed to know what they would have wanted, right? And so um, I think it's that fine balance because not the person who made the advanced directive didn't necessarily think about every single option that could have happened to them. And so I think that you really probably need to weigh both of them out. If you know them really well, if you think that that's, if they knew what the situation was, what would they have, have wanted? So it's that mm -hmm. substituted judgment thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's probably good to do both, to do both. Uh, we will make the oh, oh okay. So you're you're just yeah. you typing. Sorry, I can't. My eyes are not seeing yeah. screen very well. Are there any other questions? Okay. I guess before you guys move into the case presentation. Okay, let's move into the case. Okay, so um, can I read your case for you? Okay. Um, okay. This is a hundred two year old man. Uh, hundred two. That's really impressive. And Social Security says his age has an average life expectancy of two years. He has gross blood in his urine, and after two rounds of antibiotic, a urine cytology and bladder ultrasound suggests he has bladder cancer. He is asymptomatic. He has a colorful past medical history, but takes only aspirin and some vitamins for meds. He has dementia with poor memory and is able to present, knows his family, acts appropriately, and is very pleasant. He's worked as a research chemist at Goodyear for many years. Uh, he and uh, his wife live together with part-time caregivers. Um, and this person has a POA. Okay, the dementia followed a serious surgery or a fractured unstable vertebra after a fall at age of 98. Shortly thereafter, when he was more confident, they filled out a pulse form. Um, he surprised everybody by having a different view of care than his wife. He was clear that he would pursue all reasonable medical care if there was any chance of recovery. So the urologist uh, pulled up the ACS risk calculator and suggested that the overall risk for doing the uh, transurethral resection of the bladder, the proposed procedure was 6% with less than 1% chance of dying during the procedure. And the question is whether or not he should have surgery for this or await what could be an emergency room visit for bladder outlet obstruction. And the secondary question is about consent and agency for patients with this kind of dementia. So, so a uh, couple thoughts. Um, I guess we'll tackle the easy one first. So the easy one is, um, so the risk calculator thing, yeah? I, I think that's 
really fascinating because I think what 20 years ago we had no we couldn't figure this all out right we didn't have all these calculators but now there's Hippocrates and and actually there's this and people should know that there is this uh, ACS NISQIP uh, calculate risk calculator for people undergoing surgery and so you, you actually can pull it up on a website um, it's called uh, risk calculator FACS dot org and and actually, and so you put in like your 21 um, variables, and voila, and, and actually you, you type in the procedure that you want to have done, you know, and then voila, uh, out pops these uh, risk calculator of like, you know, what kind of uh, probabilities they have of uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, also, what's really cool is that they actually have this box that the options for geriatric outcomes, and the geriatric outcomes looks at things like you know, dementia. And things. So that, those are the issues that I'm actually most concerned about because when I look, so it looks like the um, the risks for, you know, surviving this procedure is, is super great. But if you look, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I looked at it and it looks, but the thing to note is that um, he has had a risk for um, obviously delirium, right? Because he has his dementia diagnosed after his surgery and everything like that. So he had a high risk of delirium. So post-operatively, his high risk is actually delirium. It's pretty, as I would say, like 15, 20%. So you, the mortality is low, but his risk for delirium is high, right? Um, and then also risk for hospital readmissions is also higher, right? So those are kind of, the, and then functionally, you know, where is he functionally? Um, I don't know where he is regards to how ambulatory it is or how what his ADL status is and, and things like that. Um, so um, it's possible so he has he's at risk for functional decline as well. Oh, okay, so he's feisty guy, yeah. That was that was him two months ago. Oh, okay. We we went out to a little a little place for lunch. Okay, so yeah, so it's ambulating without any uh, assistive device, anything like that. He uses a walker. Okay, okay. Yeah, so his risk for functional decline is, is also a little bit elevated as well. And so my question at this point would be, you know, what matters to him, right? Um, so what matters? Is it um, his functional status that matters to him? remaining independent? Is it his cognitive status that matters to him? Because if he becomes delirious and unable to care for himself, and, and, and you know, that's a huge risk factor for placement, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, because uh, depending on the help at home, right, he's gonna need 24 seven supervision. Or does, what matters to him? Is it his wife that matters the most, you know, that, be worried about her and what she thinks and things like that. You know, what matters? So I don't know if you can shed some light on what matters. Because. Well, um, I think that his, what he, his wife matters, certainly, and then their relationship, I think, is, we've come to recognize that even though she, she's the primary caregiver, and sometimes her judgment about what to do is not optimal. Uh, she's actually limited the caregivers coming to the house some, uh, to some extent. Um, that their relationship is the most important thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, because I'm, you know, because if he should become delirious, and, may, and it's, unfortunately, you know, sometimes I see this, right? They, they get delirious. And recovery from delirium may take a long time. For some people, recovery from delirium is a week, right? For some people, it may take three months, and for others, it never goes away, and if they stay delirious. So, you know, and if delirium is gonna be, you know, the issue where he's gonna need more helpers coming into the house and he can't live with that, you know, that's kind of a problem, right? So that's just, these are some of the things to kind of consider. What, what's the cause of the delirium for in this case? Um, being in the hospital. Yeah, hospital. I mean, it's an outpatient procedure, or I don't know, inpatient. Or I don't know how much monitoring he's going to need, or I don't know what anesthesia they're going to use. Uh, there's a lot of different components, but um, I would say that his risk for delirium, while it's elevated, 
be, just because of the fact that he's had delirium in the past and he has underlying dementia. If he should get um, obstruction um, and complications uh, from not doing the procedure, um, his risk for delirium and poor outcomes is even higher. Huh. Right. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Well, yes, there is no, there is an increased immediate risk, but then he may have an even increased higher risk later, from which he may have even more trouble recovering from. Right? Well, that was the original. That's the original uh, paradox that we were trying to figure out: is that the risk of doing nothing versus the risk of the procedure. Of doing something. Yeah. So of doing. So that's the risk versus benefit. So that's why. You know, so, so, so somewhat we also need to know what is the life expectancy? You know, what do we expect? Uh, we don't know what stage this is, right? The bladder. Is it metastasized? Is it local? Is it... It's, uh, it does not appear to be metastasized but on, the, on whatever information, limited information that we have at this point. But uh, it, that's right. It's not known. The, the invasion into the bladder wall is often how they stage that. And yeah. we don't, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that's, and then, you know, is this procedure an outpatient procedure? Is it odd in the hospital? You know, if somebody with dementia goes to the hospital, their chances of having anxiety and, uh, you know, delirium and complications is a little bit higher, right? Especially it's likely to be, likely to be a same day procedure. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's good thing. Yeah. Um, so I guess those are the things that we need to think about. So, you know, how what's his prognosis with regards to obstruction or future bleeding? You know, and how high is his immediate risk? Because you know he could have a great quality of life if we do nothing. And he would stay home and continue to celebrate and do this and go out for lunch and then enjoy his wife and do all that stuff. And we really just wouldn't have to deal with that. And if he goes, he would probably go, I would say, if he has an event, um, if he doesn't recover from it, he'd go kind of, he'd get, he'd get bad and then he'd get bad quickly. And then would that be okay with everybody? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean, that's sort of what we're kind of looking at. And then with regards to capacity, um, dementia does not mean a person doesn't have capacity. I mean, people like to think that you know, the de uh, dementia is based on a cognitive evaluation, based on the mini mental status, what score you have, and stuff like that. Capacity um, is based on, um, is task specific. So a person with dementia may have the capacity to choose their healthcare proxy because they can tell you, I trust you. I know who you are, I trust you, mm -hmm. and you know who I am, and I can tell you what's important to me, you know? However, if you try to present them with the options of A versus B versus C, and this is the risk for delirium, and this is the risk for functional impairment, and this is a, it's just beyond, it's too complicated, they cannot make those decisions, right? So, um, so that's so. It's important to know that capacity is task specific, and 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 um, and just because they have de dementia doesn't mean you don't have the discussion though, uh, because um, right. you need to respect who they are and the extent to which they can share things with you. So actually, that's a, that's a good point. We, we've we sort of decided that we would continue to talk about this as if it were uh, blood in the urine, which is which is true, uh, rather than, ta than using the word cancer, because, because while he wouldn't remember the story later, and he doesn't, he wouldn't remember, he doesn't even remember the blood in the urine story later, um, that we thought that the sort of the emotional tone or the emotional sort of seed of talking about cancer could be upsetting in a way that he wouldn't, he would be upset without knowing exactly what was upsetting him, but it would be registered in a, at an emotional level rather than a cognitive level. And so we were, we were reluctant to, to use the word cancer in the discussions about this. What, what do you think about that? 
Um, I, I think that's entirely valid. Uh, have you watched the movie The Farewell? Yes. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, it just totally, you know, it totally makes you rethink the whole concept of, you know, paternalism, right? I mean, and, uh, versus the family, you know, hiding the diagnosis. But on the other hand, you know, I think especially when people have dementia, what can they handle? I mean, with, if a person with dementia keeps, you know, keeps saying, where's my husband? And you say, oh, he died. And then they grieve all over again every day. I mean, yeah. what's the point of that, right? And you can just tell them, well, you know, he went out on an errand, he'll be back tonight, you know? And then they're happy, right? So what can they handle? I think that that's also important as well. So what about even considering like, is he still on aspirin? You know, he, does take, he does take an aspirin a day. So I guess I'm thinking that would perhaps holding the aspirin in this setting be better for him uh, in a sense where, you know, if there's Just less the blood, less, I mean, there may be less blood in the urine, um, which would be less distressing. It may, it may not change um, the outcome, but perhaps from a, you right. know, a distress, what can he handle standpoint, that might be something to consider. Yeah. He's not stressed out by it. He's, he's happy, happy go lucky. And, he yeah. doesn't pay much attention to that stuff, that darkness in the, in the, in this, uh, you know, under, underwear. Okay. Well, if it doesn't worry, you know, I, I, and sometimes at the stage with dementia, you know, sometimes it's just quality of life that kind of matters more. Um, you know, but one, one way you could, uh, I guess, have you tried talking to him a little bit about like, you know, what if? What if this was a scenario? How would you feel? And he might just say, ah, oh, you know, forget that. I'm, I, you know, I just want to stay happy the way I am and live with my wife and be happy. And if things happen to me, you know, okay, sera, sera, right? Then you sort he's, of. He saw the urologist and when they talked about going to surgery, he seemed game for doing that. Right. Right. Because <laughs> he's suggestive to everything. Yeah. Going uh, on. So, yeah. So. From what you're telling me, you know, he has, you know, significant dementia, but, you know, he, but, so he can't, but he can't make, weigh the decision specifically of what is, um, so the capacity is he has to be able to understand the nature of the problem, the risks and the benefits of the procedure, and make a decision and communicate that, right? So he probably doesn't have the capacity to make those medical decisions, but you know, he appointed a DPOA to do this, right? To make, do the substituted judgment. And so I guess the key thing for you is to ask him what matters most to you. And, and then basically base your decision on what matters most to him and what will make him the happiest based on what you know about him. Um, and so if it's going to be, you know, living happily ever after with his wife, you know, yeah. And, and there's a small risk of having, um, I mean, it's safe procedure. I mean, he's going to survive. That's not the issue at all, right? He's probably not going to have that many complications from the medical standpoint. The, the question, the problem I have is, is the delirium question. I think that's his biggest risk. I, I guess I'm I'm puzzled about that because the delirium I might you, that might be true. He he has a little bit of delirium. He sundowns on, on a almost daily basis, uh, but that I usually think of that as more self limited. I would expect that would be true post anesthesia that he would have a similar kind of situation where he does, he's disoriented and doesn't know where he is. Right. The delirium. Right. Yeah. But how long, you said that could last for weeks. Yeah, I can't predict it. Um, and I've had patients have it go on for months. And then I've had people say to me, if I had known that they would have been, that this is what would have happened to them, I'm referring to the delirium, and they wouldn't be cognitively the same after that, I wouldn't have agreed to this procedure. Right, because everything in your consent form has bleeding and infection and death and all that, but nobody talks about the risk for delirium. But what matters to some people is, you know, I don't want to be crazy loopy and anxious and drive my family crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. So th that's, that's the, that's the yeah. tricky thing. 
Yeah. And I think going, I mean, from a pharmacy standpoint, going into yes. whatever, mm -hmm. whatever intervention, um, I would give a strong look at cleaning up the med yes, before. beforehand. So like a preemptive strike and cleaning up his med list, um, stopping whatever is, yeah. he's on really nothing. He's okay. Yeah, he's, 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 all, he's, yeah he's, he's cleaned up already. Yeah, so. that's good. So, yeah. yeah, so I mean, it says that on when I did the risk calculator thing, right, that um, his risk for delirium post-op would be about 15%. It's not nothing. I mean, it's not a lot, but it's not nothing. Right. You know, and so if you do this procedure, you know, maybe I expect, a, you know, obviously the risk factor doesn't go to past 100 years old, right? And so, I, you know, so maybe I would say, maybe I would say his risk is about 20, 25% for delirium post-op. Is that something? Mm. Oh. Good. Well, you know, thank you. And, but, Delirium, actually, so the, the thing is, so what do you do with delirium that, that lasts for a long time? So I tell patients, families, actually, we don't know how long it lasts, so you need to plan for the long haul. So if, that means you need to plan for 24-7 caregivers um, to make sure that they're eating and feeding and, you know, taking care of, you know, and not, not at risk for falling and, and things like that. And then you provide supportive care. That's all you can do for delirium. You provide supportive care until they come out of it. And so that's probably, so if, if you were to plan, that's what I would plan. It's like, okay, let's go through the procedure. We're going to plan for as if he's going to have delirium, and we're going to increase the caregiver support and maximize the, uh, you know, minimize the meds, you know, make sure that they're blood transfused if they need it, you know, or, you know, optimize, right? Optimize medically. And then, you know, kind of hang on there and go for the three months planning as if he's going to have delirium for three months and then sort of see. And if he survives, that's great. Any anesthesia recommendations? Would you would you lean towards uh, a, um, it's pretty tricky, you know, a, a regional anesthesia involves spine, you know, spinal anesthesia involves a 102-year-old spine. Mm -hmm. And uh, local anesthesia has its own kind of complications. And and general anesthesia as well. So yes. any sense about, or any advice, re yeah, ideas yeah. about that? Uh, not right now, but that is a very in, in, a very um, important topic to explore because there's actually more research coming out on that now. I think people are studying that now. Um, when they hopefully, didn't before. Well, hopefully, I would, <laughs> hopefully they don't use Versed. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, for induction. Yeah, for, or, or, yeah, yeah. Because that would make it worse. But because anything beyond that, anything sleepers like yeah. is, you know, is, make it yeah, is, is worse. Should I suggest that to the anesthesiologist? I have to tell you, negotiating the pathways is always very challenging. As a, I think, no, I think no. as a, well, as a concerned fa a family member, I think there's there's one level of that, and then as a concerned family member who's a physician is another level of that. Yeah, worst patient. Uh, <laughs> and especially if you're getting into specialty things, they said, the urologist said, oh, the anesthesiologists work with these 90 to 100 year olds all, all the time down there and yeah. where, they, where they live. I, I, I won't say where they live to anonymize it a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, yeah so. I don't know, but there are there are there is research coming out now, and I haven't I'm not so up to date on, but I know I'm aware that it's actually being studied now. Not so much before, so it's it's. I mean, you know, they keep making progress, so I can look into that. Yeah, I think uh, the whole topic of uh, you know pre-op uh, in geriatric patients is a good topic, maybe sometime for the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Thank you so much for discussing it and for considering it. Thank you, Aida and, and Chad, everybody, Mary. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. I know it's five minutes later, but I just want to also mention that last week we talked about ageism, right? And this just gets to the point, you know, your case, a 102-year-old, I think, you know, an ageist physician provider would have said, oh, no, he's too old for that and be done, right? But, right. And there are, and there are out there. His PCP, who uh, who I asked about the aspirin, has been a little bit slow to to sort of regard this in the in the light that we've been d discussing it. You know, it's kind of it's been a little bit difficult with his PCP. 
Right. And so I think that this is a really, uh, I mean, people are living longer. They're living into the 80s, 90s, and 100s. And we need to start looking at screening for cancer and uh, pre-op assessment and all this stuff. Any other, you know, tube feeding, any of these discussions have to be not based on age alone, but on comorbidities and function and quality of life and what matters most to that person. And so I think that's why all of these tools are coming out with these prognosis, you know, risk calculators and things like that. So which helps, but that doesn't substitute the what matters thing and that each patient and family is individual. Yeah, what matters. So, I, was, I was surprised that the social security calculator said that for people with his birthday, he had a two year life expectancy. We we, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed that at all. Yeah, the longer you live, the longer you live. <laughs> Lo longer you're gonna live, right? <laughs> yeah, that, you know, so that's my favorite thing is that sometimes it's the uh, it's the, the the folks over 100 years old are are actually the healthiest and the feistiest people I know <laughs> because they didn't get that way. You can't get to 100 unless you're healthy and functional and feisty. <laughs> Right? Oh, pretty feisty. Yeah, so you can't get that way unless, you know, that's, that's how you are, so. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and thanks everybody. Oh, before you go, the topic for next month actually is going to be the dialysis decision. Oh boy. Cool, we'll talk dialysis about dialysis. Cool. And after that, in January, we're gonna do cancer screening in older adults. So we're gonna revisit this whole discussion again, probably about ageism. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know whether or not to screen. There was a grand rounds recently that was an update on uh, peritoneal dialysis that you might want to yeah. look into for good it was ahead of a bunch of excellent stuff about it. Okay peritoneal good. dialysis okay great thank you thanks thank everybody. you all. thank you if Rick if Rick comes if, he's, if he comes